Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. You can subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast, at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite download service, and never miss the great content we offer. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, Professor of History at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of The War Room. It is a pleasure to have you with us. One of the surprise bestsellers of 1978 was The Third World War, August 1985, written by a former NATO general, Sir John Hackett, and his colleagues. Describing a future conflict between the Warsaw Pact and NATO forces, largely but not exclusively in Europe, it offered a harrowing yet ultimately hopeful narrative in which NATO, spoiler alert, successfully resisted the surprise Warsaw Pact invasion, though only after engaging in a major buildup recommended by the authors of the book, who hoped to offer with it both entertainment and instruction. The book may not be a literary classic, but it sold quite well thanks to a breathless ad campaign that included the blurb, quote, this book occupies a place under the Bible on President Carter's desk, close quote. Apparently, Carter's copy was a gift from British Prime Minister James Callaghan. Hackett's book is a particularly important historical document of the late 1970s reaction against arms control and detente in certain circles who feared that NATO and the West were falling behind the Soviets. It is also, however, a famous example in at least two popular literary genres, the military techno-thriller and the Cold War apocalypse story. Hackett is both the heir to Pat Frank and Neville Shute and also the ancestor of Tom Clancy and so many others, and his work retains interest for just those reasons. Today, we have with us two guests to discuss Hackett's work and its place in those various genres. One of them is Professor Adam Seip, whose 2019 essay in the Journal of Military History, Visionary Battle Scenes Reading Sir John Hackett's The Third World War, inspired this discussion, and our own Dr. Tom Brasino, Associate Professor in the Department of Military Strategy Planning and Operations here at the U.S. Army War College, who is also editor of our Dusty Shelves section at the War Room and is thus our expert on important works in military history and studies, memorable and forgotten. Professor Adam Seip is Assistant Provost for Graduate and Professional Studies, as well as Professor of History and Associate Department Head at Texas A&M University. His research focuses on war and social change in modern Germany, transatlantic relations, and the history of the Holocaust. His most recent books are Strangers in the Wild Place, Refugees, Americans, and a German Town, 1945 to 1952, and Modern Germany in Transatlantic Perspective, co-edited with Michael Meng. Welcome to A Better Peace, Dr. Seip, and welcome back, Dr. Tom Brasino. Good to be here. Well, thanks very much, Ron. It's, it's great to join you and Tom for this. You bet. So, so Adam, I want to start with you. So who was Sir John Hackett, and why did he write this book? Sir John Hackett uh, is, if, if you were making a movie and you wanted to cast an eccentric British soldier scholar, uh, they would send you Sir John Hackett. Um, he, he is one of those characters that you start writing about in the course of historical research and just fall down a rabbit hole of fascination with. Um, John Hackett was born in 1910 uh, in Perth, Australia. He's the son of uh, a newspaper publisher. Uh, when he was a teenager, he, he emigrated to, to Britain for school, uh, attempting to be an academic, but it just never really came together for him. So he ended up joining the army. Uh, and he had this just absolutely unfictionalizable army career. Uh, at the outbreak of World War II, he was stationed in uh, British Mandatory Palestine. Uh, he fought in uh, the, the Transjordan. Uh, he fought in the Western Desert. He uh, was then 
promoted and ended up commanding the 4th Parachute Brigade uh, in the drop at Arnhem during Operation Market Garden, uh, during which he was badly wounded and was hidden by the Dutch resistance, which eventually smuggled him back out from behind German lines. Uh, In the meantime, he picked up uh, a couple of, of academic degrees. He was a frustrated medievalist uh, and spent time at the University of Graz in Austria. Uh, He was married to an Austrian woman, which was seen as something of a career killer during the Second World War, but he somehow managed to to kind of avoid that. Um, And then during the 50s and 60s, he emerged as, as one of the the great soldier scholars of the British army. He spent time in Northern Ireland, uh, eventually being the commanding general of British forces there, and and served what would be his last command and and his most important command uh, as the commander of the British Army of the Rhine uh, in 1967, which also meant that he was the uh, senior commander on the northern flank of NATO forces, uh, Mm. which is really important for for what happened later on because it, it gave him all of these contacts Uh, at NATO. When he retired, he then got to fulfill the the dream of being an academic and and became essentially the president of King's College London, which is where his papers are today. Uh, He was every bit as eccentric as a university administrator as he had been as a a soldier. Uh, He joined student protests in the 1970s, famously wearing a bowler hat and carrying an umbrella. Uh, And he also became a a well-respected defense intellectual, someone who wrote for the popular press in Britain about defense issues. He had been very close to Basil Little Hart, spoke at Little Hart's funeral, uh, and was a a loud and proud proponent of conventional rearmament. He was a fierce critic of Britain's uh, drawdown of conventional forces during the Cold War and uh, repeatedly warned the public that Britain's conventional weakness could be exploited by the Soviet Union in, uh, in Central Europe. Hmm. And and so that helps to explain the motivation behind this particular book, which definitely, while, while projecting the war eight years into the future, is basically saying, boy, I'm glad, aren't we glad that NATO built up its forces because if this war had happened in 1977, we would have been in big trouble. Yes. I mean, the story of how he came to write the novel is is itself kind of remarkable. Uh, in 1977, he published a memoir called I Was a Stranger, which was about his experience being hidden by the Dutch underground. And, and Hackett, uh, among other things, was a, a deeply believing Christian. And in his, in his account of his time in hiding, he, he wrote about of confronting his faith. And it, it, the book was published to very, very little acclaim. Um, it was kind of a, a, a strange book, neither fish nor fowl. Uh, but it attracted the attention of a London publisher, Sidgwick and Jackson, that had the idea that it might be commercially successful and useful to find a soldier who was willing to write a piece of speculative military fiction, which they thought that the public was, was, was potentially interested in. Uh, And so they approached uh, Hackett who agreed if he was allowed to bring together a kind of team of experts to craft out a plot. And that's, that's something that uh, I I certainly want to talk about here and the Mm -hmm. process by which this, this team assembled itself. But basically they, they, met at a bunch of London clubs where they drank heavily and talked about what the Third World War would look like. Uh, the, the, when you look at Hackett's papers in the, the Little Heart archives at King's College London, which if any of your listeners are, are interested in doing historical research, there are few better places in the world to do research in military history than the Little Heart archives at, at uh, King's College London. It is a tremendous repository. Um, but uh, it looks like it was a heck of a lot of fun putting this team together. It was retired military people, retired diplomats, a couple of journalists uh, that, that mm. sketched out this story about what the Third World War would look like. And um, I, I'm trying to remember because I, uh, unfortunately, I don't have my paperback, my very beat up paperback copy at hand. But are the other, are any of the other authors directly cited anywhere in the book? I mean, I know that on the cover, it just says General Sir John Hackett and colleagues. Does he say who these other people are in the book? The, ori- the original plan was that that 
the other authors were going to get some kind of credit. But that got more challenging. Several of them weren't fully retired yet, and so they oh. couldn't have their names formally linked to it. Um, a couple of others didn't end up delivering the quality of material that Hackett wanted. He <laughs> complains frequently in his letters about having to rewrite things. Um, I, his his naval specialist wrote a version of, of the proposed war in the Atlantic that was so britain centric that it stretched the grounds of credibility and so hackett had to sort of fire him um it, it was it was really quite a process uh, and there's also uh, a, an element to this which, which i think is really important and that is that there were a number of people who hackett contacted who ended up not wanting to have their names formally associated with, oh. with the book for, for different reasons um and and that's something I, I think that 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 might kind of be of interest to to some of the listeners here um hackett as as I said, was was deeply connected with NATO. And so he knew a number of the, the most important uh, American generals at the time. Um, and so you know, bear in mind, this is the this is the late 1970s. This is this is America's post-Vietnam army. Um, one of, of Hackett's closest American collaborators was uh, William Depew, the legendary American general and, and the man who was at that point just about to retire from uh, his, his role commanding training and doctrine command. Hmm. Um, and the, the correspondence between Hackett and Depew is, is absolutely fascinating. Um, and, and this is a, a point that I want to want to stick with for a minute, uh, again, because because of the nature of, of your audience. Um, if, if you when you read Hackett's book, uh, it's the Americans that really save the day. It's right. the U.S. Army uh, on the southern flank of, of the NATO forces in Central Europe, uh, which which ultimately blunts and, and starts to roll back the Soviet offensive. Um, it is a very muscular, high tech U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see in the correspondence that, that, in fact, Hackett's version of the U.S. Army is William Depew's version of the U.S. Army. And when you read Depew's letters to Hackett, and I'm, I'm going to quote just briefly here, um, you know, Depew is, is writing a sort of fantasy version of what he thinks the America's post-Vietnam army is. And Depew writes to Hackett, and I'm quoting here, the U.S. Army was in far better shape than anyone, especially the Soviets, realized. Fully recovered from the Vietnam experience of the decade past, the process of rejuvenation, modernization, and battle indoctrination had been pressed hard. I mean, hmm. effectively, this is Hackett's version of the U.S. Army is, is taken from the mind of one of the visionary leaders of the U.S. Army at the time, though, though Depew... Um, specifically asked Hackett not to give him credit. And the reason is that, as Depew said in his later correspondence, uh, Hackett's vision of the Third World War has NATO failing to hold the German border. Yes. And Depew had been a career-long advocate of the principle of forward defense, that Germany's borders would be held. And Depew said to Hackett, I, I won't have my name attached to a vision in which NATO is unable to defend the German borders. Uh, it's really kind of a remarkable mm. piece of correspondence, but it, it points to this transatlantic connection and this transatlantic conversation that I think is critical if, if you're going to understand the, the, the kind of the way that this book came together. And, and if you're going to understand, frankly, America's post-Vietnam army, because there's a conversation going on between this retired British general and a retiring American general that, that helped to shape how Hackett saw the coming of the Third World War. Interesting. Well, thank you. I want to bring you um, into this conversation, Tom Brasino, uh, based on what Adam was just saying, but also in general, is what kind of value do we get out of, out of rereading works like this that are, that are clearly written for a particular time and place? Um, you know, what do they, what can they teach us? Well, it's an interesting, I mean, there, it's an interesting, uh, case, uh, because there, there's, there's some great value to it. Um, I was, I was thinking about this when it comes to fiction in general, mm -hmm. the way that people can kind of, you know, learn things, you know, historians, academics were kind of you know, notoriously bad at, at teaching, um, what we want to teach, right? Uh, you right. know, we, we go in, into <laughs> classes and we try, we try to get stuff across to students and it's, it's sort of a lost cause. And in some cases it's, um, just because of total lack of interest, but all, in other cases, it's because ideas have been have sort of seeped in on people through, through fiction, uh, through movies, through, um, through other formats through TV and all of that. So 
you know, this is a kind of an interesting case of this, you know, Depew's version is just one version of, of where the army's at. He had a little bit more of a, a, a negative view and, and the focus on active defense and how effective it would be. Uh, or, or he, or he had you know, a view that that would, that that would be effective. And that was kind of rejected by a lot of other folks in the U S army. So, I mean, it's kind of like used with care, uh, maybe red storm rising mm-hmm. ends up kind of capturing a little bit of the, you know, the, the, the reforms more developed, Mm-hmm. version um of, of what it would look like or what they thought it would look like uh, so yeah i mean it's, it's it's great because it um you know it's sort of funny like it, it's it's great in a way because i mean how many people would know what the full to gap was uh if, if it wasn't for these kinds of books you know right. you, and we use this this term almost like it, it's a shorthand uh for folks and it's because of this you know as mm-hmm. much as as much as the actual training and, and people can understand what that means um, so it's, it's a, it's kind of a mixed bag with these, like they, they can be kind of, they can be kind of good and they can be kind of, uh, they, they can also then lead to sort of entrenched ideas that you can't like, you can't unseat mm-hmm. from people, you know? And, and so they, so they're kind of stuck in sort of thinking a certain way about stuff. Uh, and also is like, and in this case too, I think is a, um, I was reading something else recently that was kind of making a, a, a similar case to some of the stuff you see in here. And, and I've, you know, only read parts of this book. I haven't read this all the way through yet. Um, I've been enjoying Adam's uh, writings about it uh, as much as as the book itself. But, you know, that the idea of what kind of came out of the 73, the, the Arab Israeli wars mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 73 and what came out of that and and what they thought they knew about about Warsaw Pact versus NATO technology and weapons. And then like how rapidly that changed. And you get this, you know, 1991 and, you know, uh, and all, you know, all you know, well beyond the calculations, uh, the the best hope for calculations when you started putting that same kind of technology against each other, where it was in the Gulf War, right? Uh, so you know, you kind of have this, it, and this book sort of sits right in that, right on the sort of pivot there, right? Uh, so it's kind of a, it's kind of interesting uh, whether it's you know how accurate it is, right? Yeah, you know, the, you know the, the, there no, there's no Abrams in this one, right? They, they're not there yet. There's no Abrams. There's no uh, Bradley. There's right. a, yeah. there's so a lot of stuff that's not there yet. Yeah. yeah. So, so some of that is kind of missing. So you kind of see the, you know, the, a little bit of that, what's left over and Depew is responding to that, right. That, that the 73 war. And if you look at the army doctrine that he was most responsible for the 1976 operations manual, 100 dash five, he was, you know, it has graphic, it has graphics in it of, of ranges of weapons and, and effectiveness, you know, comparisons of weapons, something you never saw in those kind of manuals ever uh, before that or ever again after, um, you know, because of, of, you know, this little, this little lab experiment that happened in the Middle East in 1973, you know, from, I, I don't want to diminish the war, but as no. a, as a, you know, from the perspective of these, you know, military leaders in the, in the cold war, it's like this lab where they kind of look at these weapons and, and see what happens. Right. So yeah, it's an interesting, it's, it's great to, to have some of these cause it kind of puts you into these little spots and, and you get to see kind of what's state of the art for a moment. You can learn something about it, but then you have to be careful because stuff changes uh, and it is speculative. Right. And it changes, it changes very fast. And so to go back to you, Adam, uh, you know, I had my, I had the quote from, you know, the Callahan gave Carter a copy and that Carter kept it on his desk. We don't know for how long, we don't know how long it stayed there under the Bible. Um, but, uh, what was the, the international reception of the third world war? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, it's a little bit difficult to, to sum up quickly just mm-hmm. how, big and influential this book was. I mean, the, the numbers are, are fairly straightforward. It, it, it sold 3 million copies. Um, it, it spent 40 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, 26 editions, 10 languages. Uh, nobody expected this book to be the kind of commercial <laughs> success that it was. Um, but the numbers alone don't, don't convey just, just how big a book this was. I mean, one of the really striking things in, in doing the research for this piece was was seeing the range of places where this book was reviewed and talked about. Mm. It was an absolute publishing sensation. A, a, a bookstore manager I quote in the article says that it, the only comparison he could make was to The Godfather, which I think is a very <laughs> odd comparison, but there you go. Okay. Um, it, it, it was it was a book, and part of the argument that I make in the article is, is that uh, it was a book that was so successful and so influential because it it was such a, a kind of global book. Uh, it was a book that let people in all different parts of the world think about war. 
And mm-hmm. so it was it was reviewed and, and told and serialized in publications all over the world. And one of my favorite examples was a, an article from the, the newspaper in Durban, South Africa, which which was all about the part of the Third World War novel that was set in Africa. It was like Indeed. the rest of the world hadn't happened. It was mm-hmm. about the invasion of South Africa by Cuban troops in, right. in Hackett's book. And and my, the another favorite thing about that review is that it had an author photo of Hackett, but somebody obviously got the photos confused and it was in fact a photo of the then late german chancellor conrad adenauer instead of <laughs> instead of hackett I, I don't i don't I, I don't laugh out loud often while doing research but that made me laugh out loud um and in fact the the reason that i i got into this book and that i wrote this article was that i i'm the larger book project that I'm working on is a social history of the U.S. Army in Germany during the Cold War, mm-hmm. and I was doing research for that, and I kept running into these discussions of, of Hackett's book in the late 1970s in Germany. Um, this book was an absolute, uh, absolutely momentous uh, bestseller in Germany, which was a complete shock. Mm-hmm. Uh, the The Munich publisher Bertelsmann was going to publish a translation, but they didn't really want to because they didn't think it would sell. And then Der Spiegel, the weekly news magazine, serialized the the story and it took off and Bertelsmann rushed it into translation. Um, it's another one of these kind of international uh, uh, collaborations with this with this book. The, the, mm-hmm. the German general, uh, Graf von Kielmannsegg, uh, took over the translation of the book because he thought the German translator did a lousy job. And Kielmannsegg and Hackett were old friends. And so Kielmannsegg was keeping Hackett informed of all of this. Anyway, um, Kielmannsegg wrote this, this extraordinary introduction to the German edition where he he cautioned German readers that while NATO troops in the book had fallen back from the German borders, Uh that in the event of an actual war, he was confident that NATO could hold the inter-German border. Um, So so this, this, in the case of the, the translation into German, it very much played into German security anxieties in the Mm -hmm. late 1970s, which then dovetailed really nicely with what, and of course Hackett had no control over this, what subsequently happened, which is the Soviet Mm -hmm. invasion of Afghanistan, the ratcheting up of Cold War tensions, and the NATO dual track decision, which, which brought nuclear weapons very much into the forefront of discussions about, about European security in a way that they hadn't been before. Very true. And of course, one of the ironies, once again, spoiler alert for those of you who haven't had a chance to read this book in the 43 years since it was published, the um, uh, that nuclear weapons play a, a minor role in the Third World War. Uh, they, well, they, they, they play a significant role in bringing it to an end, but there, are, there is not the kind of massive uh, battlefield exchange of nuclear weapons that people were afraid of, nor, nor does the one exchange of nuclear weapons lead to a strategic uh, launch, which I wonder if that's not if that doesn't also reflect sort of the let, let's say the army focus of the people who wrote it that they just um, they're able they 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 do talk about the air force they talk about the airlift of of equipment across the Atlantic but they uh, they there's not a lot of air uh, airland battle um, or what airland battle takes place in this book is very much conventional. So, Ron, I think that this is an important point about about this book yep. and about its its popularity. If I was guessing here, so you know, with the advent of nuclear weapons, you have what uh, I would argue is probably the only time you have something that 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 potentially is an actual paradigm shift mm-hmm. in in military affairs in war. Right, all of the old language goes out. Yeah, war itself is is the enemy. If anything, if a war breaks out, it's a world ender. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the other stuff we used to use to describe it goes away. And one of these things that that you know you kind of see these these this pushback against this from time to time in the Cold War that oh yeah well maybe maybe it'll just be you know uh, unconventional wars under this as, you know proxy wars or proxy conventional wars or unconventional wars under the umbrella under this threat of nuclear weapons uh, but but really a lot of the intellectual energy and a lot of the uh, popular culture you know both in the seventies and later and you know, especially in the eighties you know went to this kind of apocalyptic world ending scenarios you know war. Yeah nukes it's mad max time let's roll you know so it's uh uh you know fury road if you want to get real crazy um so so i think the the idea that you could have a war and it could actually you know still look like kind of a normal war Mm -hmm. uh you know we kind of make fun of it like oh yeah this is just what their view they want to have this view but 
you know, inside the military is because they want to, you know, the army wants to have a role right. in this and it's not just an air force show and a missile show. Um, but they're, but you know, they were right. You know, we, right. we did fight a bunch of conventional we did, wars and, underneath. and we have, and we have not, at least as of, as of, as of, uh, the time we are recording right now, we have not had yeah. the apocalypse yet. Yeah. Let's, let's be careful. It's 2020. Let's <laughs> knock on wood about this. Um, we still have, we still have a month and a half to go here. So this could, this, this could go you know, poorly. So let's not, yeah, let's not, let's not tempt fate on this too much, but yes, no, so far we're, we're, we're doing okay uh, with it. So, yeah, I mean, it is an important, you know, so, and I think that, that, you know, that, that sort of glimmer of hope, uh, you know, sort of funny when you talk about that in war, right. You know, oh God, maybe we could just fight a regular war. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a glimmer of hope. And I think that that sort of resonated with people uh, when everything else you're getting is day after kind of stuff and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, Terminator and, um, war games and, and, uh, you know, and, and all the kind of game theory stuff that was very dominating in security studies, you know, so you got these kind of guys who are sort of below that level, just sort of toiling away, but like, you know, but what if a fight breaks out and right. we don't use nukes or we don't primarily use nukes, you know, it doesn't go to, you know, enough nukes to destroy the world six times over. So, um, it's kind of, I think that's, that's part of, you know, the, why this book resonates, um, that's and why it's sort of worth reading again. Right. Go ahead, Adam. Oh, yeah. So if I may, uh, the, the the issue of the nuclear exchange and, and broadly for your, your listeners, when the Soviet invasion starts to go awry, uh, the Soviet leadership uh, sends a small nuclear missile to destroy Birmingham and mm-hmm. NATO in response destroys Minsk. And it, it's clear from the correspondence that, that in fact, the Hackett and his team really wrestled with which cities to destroy. I think they took some glee out of destroying Birmingham, but they weren't sure about Minsk. And in fact, there's a wonderful piece of correspondence where the Belarusian exile community in London complained vociferously about the destruction of Minsk. And so there was some discussion that if the book was ever translated into Eastern European languages, they'd need to change the city. But anyway. Um, Do we know if they did, Adam? They did not. They did not. Okay. There was discussion, but they they, they did not. But 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 uh, the, on a more a more sort of a larger scale, um, the fact that there's a limited nuclear exchange was really important because Hackett thought it privately that the book was way too optimistic. Mm-hmm. But an awful lot of readers thought that losing two cities and millions of people was kind of pessimistic, right. and and. This became an issue when when Reagan in 1984, kind of out of nowhere, said that this was one of the most important books he'd ever read, put together a list of the three most important books he'd ever read, and this was one of them. And there was some kind of concern among parts of the American press that the president was endorsing a book where there was a nuclear exchange. Well, two years later, Tom Clancy published Red Storm Rising, in which the story is broadly the same, except there's no atomic exchange. And that became Reagan's kind of go-to referent, right. replacing the Third World War. And the difference is Red Storm Rising does not end with two smoldering ruins where Minsk and Birmingham used to be. Right. And, and of course, that is, of course, the fascinating thing about fiction that claims to be both speculative and uh, instructive in a way is when, when push comes to shove, the authors will make literary choices. And, you know, and, and, and going back to what, what Tom suggested, right, certain books are more fun to read when they don't result in the destruction of all of humanity. Um, and that, that sort of appeals in a particular way, which leads me to sort of our final uh, thoughts here. We only have about five minutes left, but uh, I wanted to ask, based on the various genres we're talking about here, the techno thriller or the uh, or the third world war kind of books, um, do either of you have any books that you would especially like to recommend uh, in this genre uh, for our for our listeners? So I'll, go, I'll start with you, Adam. Sure. Thanks. Um- so this writing this article and doing this project gave me an opportunity to go back and reread a bunch of military speculative fiction that I read as a kid, um, which was in the 1980s, which was which was a lot of fun. Many of these books, including I should add, the Third World War, are not great pieces of literature. With that proviso in mind, um, a couple of books that that really sort of jump out at me. One of them, a, a book that I hadn't looked at in years before I started this was was H.G. Wells' uh, 1907 novel, War in the Air, which is absolutely fascinating, not as a depiction of of military aviation, because that really wasn't a a thing yet, 
but as a vision of what war might look like in the future. This is not a, a book that I think we need to, to read as a predictor of what the future looked like, but as a vision of what a very, very smart uh, sort of intellectual thinking about social change, thought about war at the turn of the 20th century. So that's one I would recommend. And then a, a, a different book with a similar title, perhaps coming a bit more from out in left field, um, Carl Chopik's 1936 novel, War with the Newts, uh, which is a little bit difficult to, to sort of summarize quickly. It is a, a book about European politics in the 1930s told from the perspective of a small country, Czechoslovakia, in the heart of Europe, if the greatest threat to world security was a race of super intelligent salamanders. And I know I'm not doing a great job of selling the book, <laughs> but you got to read it. Um, it's an absolutely tremendous and deeply funny book about the 1930s and about what international and national security looked like in Central Europe in the 1930s. Karl Chopik's War with the Newts, I can't recommend it strongly enough. All right. Well, I like the sound of that. Uh, Tom, do you have anything to compete with super intelligent salamanders? Um, yeah. So if we're going to be... Uh, so I kind of said my, my, my piece a little bit about... I mean, I think people have, have seen a lot of those in terms, uh, you know, a lot of the back and forth, you know, kind of watchmen and and mm -hmm. after an ap potentially apocalyptic or, or apocalyptic uh, ones that have been out there in terms of like maybe a dusty shelves or make a recommendation if somebody wanted to take a swing at something like Canticle for Leibowitz mm -hmm. would be an mm -hmm. interesting one. You know, uh, I, I think, uh, you, you know, maybe there's not enough space for in ours to do, to do, to do it justice uh, in terms of sort of the themes that it's dealing with. Um, but maybe in terms of, of, you know, sort of capturing this, um, a sort of different reaction, something interesting, kind of a, you know, where we get this, um, I think David, David Brooks, something called this elephantiasis of, of reason that happens mm -hmm. in the cold war, you know, where you, you know, you, you try to get to, you try to make international affairs and, and, and strategic studies, a math problem, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that happens, uh, re really strong after world war II. you know, we, we, we solved this with technology. We can solve everything with technology kind of thing that happens, uh, hyper rationalism. And, you know, in the, in the aftermath of that, this kind of, uh, you know, that, that, that beneath that, there's this kind of religious mm -hmm. aspect going on, going on in culture too. And I think the Canticle for Leibowitz using the same sort of post-apocalyptic in a very odd, uh, interesting way that I've never really can entirely wrap my, my arms around and figured out what, what's exactly what's going on in this book. But it might be interesting if somebody wants, if it has strong views on that, it'd be an interesting one to go. And it's a good book to read anyway, I think. Absolutely. Uh, so that, that's one that's, um, you know, it's, it's never been out of print and it's, it's fairly well known, mm -hmm. uh, but not as well known as it used to be. And it might be one that, that like, Hey, let's, you know, there's some, there's some deeper issues in some of the stuff that we talk about. Um, it's worth looking at again, you know, and, and to sort of put up against something like, you know, the kind of Peter Singer stuff mm -hmm. that we have now, the future speculative nonfiction that we have now, like stuff like, or fiction like Ghost Fleet. Or, right. And the new one, I, I can't remember the name of the new one that they just came out with, but um, it's doing some sort of similar stuff. You know, what are, what are the what are these other ones that kind of get at some deeper themes in, in civilization and what does civilization mean and what does it mean when it goes away? Right. So that's an interesting one. It might be might be one to to, to look at. Excellent. Well, I'll go, go ahead, Adam. Uh, if I could add, I, mean, I, I think Tom's point is is really well taken, and and one of the things that struck me about about Hackett. Um, is, is the degree to which reviewers and readers have used Hackett as a way of understanding subsequent uh, pieces of military speculative fiction. Um, mm -hmm. There's a wonderful review of, of Singer and Cole's book, Ghost Fleet, uh, by Admiral James Stavridis, in which Stavridis says, essentially, this is the heir to Hackett's Third World War. Uh, and and you know, if you need confirmation of that, a, a brief internet search will yield you lots of poorly written internet reviews uh, that, that make that comparison. Um, so it's, it's a book that's had some real staying power and that I think in very direct ways has shaped um, subsequent efforts at, at military speculative fiction uh, in ways that sometimes even I think the authors don't, uh, don't, don't fully grasp. 
Well, that's great. Well, thank you for both of you. I have to say, uh, at the risk of self-promotion, that uh, a year and a half ago, I wrote an essay on a canticle for Leibowitz, which anybody who wants to look it up on the internet, unfortunately, it's not for the war room, so I can't mention the outlet directly. But uh, it's a great book, and I'm interested in how we think about how Hackett is continued. I will throw in one one book, an older book that I think is very worthwhile, is Don DeLillo's novel End Zone, which manages to describe the problem of nuclear strategy with relationship to the struggles of a small college football team in Texas, uh, written about 1972. It has one chapter specifically on the problem of the, of a nuclear exchange that uh, if you're interested in these questions at all, you have to read. Um, with all that in mind, unfortunately, we are just about out of time for today. So I want to thank uh, Professor Adam Seip for joining us to talk about his work. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, Thanks and a lot for having me. You bet. And thank you, Tom Bersino, for sharing your wisdom with us here uh, on The War Room. And we hope we get some more contributors to the dusty shelves to keep uh, uh, Dr. Bersino busy. That's a very important thing for us to do here. And uh, we thank all of you for listening in on today's podcast. Please send us your comments on this program and all of the programs and send us your suggestions for future uh, discussions. We uh, we always are excited about any comments that you might have. Please take a minute to rate and review this podcast on the podcatcher of your choice after you subscribe to A Better Piece, because of course you want to subscribe to A Better Piece. If you rate and review, it helps others to find us, which grows this community for these discussions. And we are always interested in having that community grow so that we can keep talking to all of you. But until next time, from The War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.